Now look at the time frame again. The book isn't published until 1678. 1665, the Black Plague breaks out in London. And 1666, God spares them by having the city burn to the ground. And London burns to the ground. The Great Fire of London in 1666. That's the background that gives you the 1666. Now look at that. 1666 is the Great Fire of London. In his day, and therefore when he publishes this, 1666, where is... Um, where is Bunyan in 1666 while London's burning to the ground? He's in prison. 60 miles away in Bedford. He's in prison. And all the, the turmoil, the uncertainty of life, the frailty of life is radically different. We have such advances in our culture in regard to political stability, at least so far. Uh, political stability in regard to uh, medicine and things of that nature and, and advances that we have. We have such stability that we really can't begin to relate to the incredible, unstable nature um, of what was going on in this time. But this helps a great deal for us to see uh, why people would be so oriented to it. We're not very oriented to it today because we have so much uh, stability. Uh, John Piper says we have too much stability in America, um, that because of that, we try to find ways to entertain ourselves. John Piper has a theory that people bungee jump because they don't have enough danger in their own life. Um, I'm not sure he's, you know, I think he may be right. Um, anyway, uh, that gives us some, some background to kind of the times here as to what is um, uh, taking place. But I want us to look at uh, John Bunyan's life itself and get us a little bit of background on that. But before we do, turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Now as we look at these two passages, I, I just want you to embrace this idea again that unrealistic expectations lead to disappointment. And if you like to play tennis without a net, you don't like tennis. We need, to, we need to think about that and, and meditate on that and, and pray about that. If you like a Christianity that isn't challenging, if you like a Christianity that's not adventuresome, if you like a Christianity that doesn't cost you everything, you, you don't like Christianity. You like something else. Now, unfortunately, there are so many people in the United States and in the world today who like that other thing with you. And, and they're still calling that Christianity. But the fact that they're calling it Christianity doesn't make it Christianity. You remember that Jeroboam, who is Jeroboam? It's Solomon's son. Rehoboam is Solomon's son. Who is Jeroboam? Uh, Solomon's servant. Yes, yes. After Solomon dies, Jeroboam, the kingdom splits, you remember? Yeah. Jeroboam becomes the king of Israel, which is the yeah. northern kingdom. Right. Okay? He sets up a new capital, Samaria. And at Bethel, he sets up a temple and an altar. Or an altar. Okay? A golden an altar with golden caps. Remember? Mm -hmm. <coughs> an altar with a golden cap, and he calls it the worship of Yahweh. He radically changes everything about true religion and denudes it entirely. It's no longer true religion, but he keeps the name Yahweh. Everything about it is false, hypocritical, non-salvific, idolatrous. But he keeps the name. And we are in a culture that is very much like that. Very much like that. That still keeps the name and I'm not talking about Episcopalians and Methodists when I say that. I'm, I'm talking about uh, the, the bulk of evangelicalism. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. All through the book, Christian is rejoicing in hope. He is confident in the God of the universe. He has no confidence in himself, but he has confidence in the God of the universe, and his eye is on the prize. His eye is on the prize. Hebrews chapter 12. 
Therefore, with such a great cloud of witnesses we have, let us run with endurance the race set before us, and uh, let us not let, get involved with the sin that so easily entangles us. Romans chapter 12. I'm sorry, Hebrews 12. But back here, his eye is on the prize. Um, verse 3. We're in Romans chapter 5, verse 3. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance, character. And character, hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. What is hope a characteristic of? It is a characteristic of God himself. It's the Imago Dei. And Christians want the Imago Dei restored. And how do you get the Imago Dei restored? What's the modus operandi? How do you get it restored? Of hope. It just holds you right there. Look in the text. Tribulation. Tribulation. Tribulation is the tennis. <laughs> if you like playing tennis but you don't like that net, you don't like tennis. If you think you like God, but you don't like suffering and affliction and challenges and things that are going to come into your life and just stir it up, then you don't like God because that's, God does that. God, God does those things. He comes into your life and He just grabs things that you're holding on to and he just, he just pulls them away sometimes. If you've never read John Piper, the... Suffering, of yeah. misery of Job, and the mercy of God. I hope we have it at a good note, local bookstore. <laughs> uh, the mercy, what is that? What did I say? The suffering of Job and the, no, it's the misery of Job and the mercy of God. I think that's what it is. The misery of Job and the mercy of God. Whatever it is, it's excellent. If you've never read it, do not pass go. Uh, get that book. And read it out loud. Oh, yes. Job is explaining to his daughter what happened in his life. His second daughter, Jemima. Remember, his first ten children are killed. But in the end of the book, he gets ten more children. And one of them, Jemima, is asking him about his life. And he tells her that his first ten children all died on the same day. And she says to him, But isn't God good and kind? And Job says to her, Your mind is right, Jemima, but it's small. He's good and and kind, but that's not all. Tennis has a net in it. And if you don't like the net, you don't like tennis. God <clears throat> has a sovereignty, a majesty, a mystery about him. And everything we know about him is that what he does is good and right and perfect and timely. And there are things there. There are dark clouds that he holds. There's a shining you know, smile behind that of, of providence. But there's dark clouds out there. And he brings them into our life. And he takes his hand and he reaches into the aquarium of our life and just stirs up the gravel and lets us see what's in there. Things that we thought were subtle or got pushed to the back of the aquarium. We, we, we are, we've lived with them so long we're just used to them. And God's like, no. God does that. John Bunyan understood that. And people who responded to this book and saw that this book was powerfully significant as a survival guide in the Christian life recognized that that's, yeah, that's biblical. That's, that's an understanding of who God is. And so they, they began to recognize that. 